This episode of MMPQB is brought to you by Unleashed Music. Artists like Dar Williams, Michelle Malone, and even Arctic Monkeys have trusted Unleashed to help get their music heard. When you're ready to take the next step in your creative career, you can find them online at unleashedmusic.com. Welcome to More Music Please, a quarantine beat. I'm your host, MK. Join me and my guest as we explore how the music industry is staying busy and keeping connected during lockdown and also just talking about whatever. Let's get started. On the line with me today from uh, his own podcast, Daniel Mark's Musical Roundup Rodeo, which is a fantastic name. He's also the uh, TM and logistics manager for Melvin Seals and JGB when the music world is in full swing. It's uh, an old friend of mine from around Kingston. I've known this guy through the scene for uh, like 10 years or something insane now. It's Daniel Mark. Hi. Hey, MK. How are you? I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. Always good to talk to a fellow podcaster. Did you start your podcast like during COVID times because you had downtime or were you already doing this? No, I I think I, I'd been thinking about it before COVID. Um, and I was just having a lot of great conversations with my musician friends. Uh, but I think it was once I, I got off the road, I really started putting some time and attention into it. But I have to say, mine is, is I, I've been listening to a lot of your episodes, and I love your show. Thank you. And mine is more of an experiment. I, I know that you do some freewheeling conversation, but mine have really spanned the range here and there from, uh, from different topics. I've gotten into some weird spots and some really long ones. I've had a couple two-hour ones. So, But it's been nice. I've been really enjoying uh, getting into it with my friends. Yeah, I try to keep mine to about an hour, mostly because of my own attention span. And I just, <laughs> like, I assume that, like, you know, an hour is, like, pretty safe for everybody. You can find an hour when you're in your car or whatever to listen to a podcast. I do listen to some longer ones, but I also just, like, this is me being a logistical coward. I've found that when my episodes go too far over an hour, I have trouble uploading them. Like, I have to, like, do a bunch of things to, like, decrease the file size. So True. I'm too lazy to deal with that. So yeah, I like to stick to an hour. But what's your, so you don't go in with any like, you know, topics to think about or anything like that. You just go in totally blind and see where it goes. Yeah, kind of. Um, you know, I, I like to have a couple things. Uh, I look into them a little bit and uh, many of them I know already. Uh, so a lot of the conversation is just kind of like friends talking to each other. But what I'm most interested in is um, is getting to those little nooks and crannies that you get to uh, many many times with musicians. They're like the most interesting kind of person to talk to. Often, so yeah. I always feel like we we get into. Sometimes it takes longer than others, but getting into some real nooks and crannies about life and uh, always trying to touch on that. But Really, it can go anywhere. I've spoken about DMT with Todd Stoops and uh, getting into the music industry with Scott Guberman, all these kind of uh, these musicians, these session musicians from around the country. So, yeah, it can kind of go anywhere. Yeah, musicians are great for interviews. You know, a lot of them are used to it, so they're not, like, afraid of it at all. And also, they appreciate this format, I find, where, like, you really can talk about anything. Because, like, you know, I was on the radio for five years, and when I would do a radio interview... I had to keep it very focused, keep it very professional, make sure I wasn't going to, you know, say anything that could possibly offend anybody or ask a question that could lead down, a, you know, a hairy road at all. And now I'm like, let's get fucking hairy. Like, let's go. Let's talk about like, yeah, exactly. Drugs and philosophy and death and all kinds of good stuff. I love getting. I love getting nerdy with musicians and like so that sometimes takes a little time to really get into that but it's there's there's nothing better to do with an afternoon than to speak to a fellow musician about music and their life it's like yeah, totally. beautiful for me so I'm really settling into it yeah likewise and you don't come from like a an interviewing background at all is that right this is kind of like a new thing for you yeah um I think a, a lot of the projects that I do are, are things that I just jump into and something that I get passionate about. I'm, I'm that kind of person. I really enjoy big projects. I'm always drawn to projects that seem like a little larger than life for a little like something that I might not be able to accomplish. And I love trying to tackle those things in different ways. And sometimes they're successful and sometimes they're not, but I always go for it. So this was kind of, of 
a, an example of that. I had this downtime. I really wanted to get these lessons out there and maybe get some education and, and value out to other people that might be listening and especially people that are curious about the music industry because I feel like a lot of the music industry is and has been shrouded in secrecy Yeah, for whatever reason. So I enjoy being able to bring my experiences from the road and from being a musician full time um, and, and kind of tell younger people or people that might be looking into it, or, or I sh should say just kind of unlocking uh, some aspects of it. So that I really love too. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's such a weird time right now. And I know, you know, we can say that over and over, but the music industry in particular is such a massive industry, you know, comprising not just artists, but, you know, a whole world of people who make their living off of live music. And it's, I would say it's not an exaggeration to say it's been hit the hardest by this shutdown. So like things are so wildly different for everyone in the music world so right now it's like extra interesting to me to talk to those people and when i started this podcast the concept was like you know we'll talk about what you're doing during the pandemic and how you're adapting and blah 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 and like you know a few weeks went by and it was like okay like everyone's gonna have the same answer so like we just should talk about whatever we feel like talking about like have you had that experience where it's like there's only so much covid you can talk about yeah, sure. Uh, you know, everybody's in the same boat in the music industry. I totally agree with you. We've been hit really hard. Um, but the interesting thing about musicians is that we're, we kind of adapt, or at least the, the ones that I talk to and, and in my experience. And so what is interesting to me is finding out how people are dealing with their business throughout this, not not so much their home life and, and everybody's kind of, yeah, they're at home, they're not on the road and maybe they're recording or, but what I'm interested in is what people are doing to figure out other ways to get content out to their fans. Um, that's all a, basically a new market right now. That's um, territory that everybody is kind of trying to get in on or figure out and to be in, in one instance, I'm a participant of that. And in another instance, when I'm talking to my friends, I'm an observer of that. And I really like seeing how people have come up with ways of marketing or, you know, a lot of people are taking the time to record right now. And yeah, that, that's, been, that's been very cool to see from all across the country, how people are still doing music in light of all of this. Yeah. What are some of the more innovative things you've seen? Because obviously we all very quickly figured out, you know, streaming shows and digital releases and things like that. Like what are some of the more like left field ones you've seen? Well, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, I think, I think the big thing for me has been actually getting my hands dirty. I'm in the midst of figuring out for Melvin Seals uh, what we're going to be doing for the end of the year and how we're going to be taking care of it. Yeah. Uh, and so that has been really cool to, to, um, to, yeah, to get my hands dirty and to understand kind of how streaming is happening. And because he's in San Francisco, um, it's like tech city over there. And so all the people that we've been talking to have, um, they're involved with Facebook. They're involved, you know, financially. They're kind of Facebook has been giving out money for people with studios to try and figure this whole thing out. And we've been speaking to some of those people. And like I said, it's experimental territory for everybody. But what people are figuring out is what people like and what people gravitate towards. So I'm not sure if I've seen anything super left field, but I'll keep thinking about it. But mostly it's been really, how can we do that streaming? How can we put on a production and do it effectively? And not just, you know, because anybody can, um, anybody can stream, you know, like yeah. anybody that wants to pick up an acoustic guitar and, and they have Facebook or Instagram, you can get on and live stream. But how do you market that correctly? How do you make something like that unique in a flood of all of that? Those are the kind of questions that we're tackling. And it's been cool to, to hear from some people what are the uh, what are the important parts of streaming. And like I was talking to 
I was on a Zoom call yesterday and we were talking about how storytelling will play a huge part in streaming and how streams are marketed and that storytelling and creating um, a, a compelling story, almost like television at this point, is going to be the key to selling tickets and keeping people interested for these streams. So. Mm. Storytelling, yeah. really. Like, so what do you mean? Like, by having like breaks in the show and, you know, kind of yeah. interacting yeah, with in the a audience sense, and gaming like that? There's both. There's both the, the uh, internal storytelling and the external storytelling. So, the internal storytelling is just like you said, yeah, like actually taking breaks and getting the audience involved and figuring out a seamless way to, uh, you know, make a production, you're basically making a TV production that includes audience members in real time. So uh, sometimes that will consist of, and we've been talking about this for Melvin, is bringing guests in um, and having, you know, hosts or special people, meaning people that we're friendly with or, or people that Melvin has known in the business for many years to ask him these questions or audience members asking questions and Melvin or the band taking that time out to actually tell a little story. Um, so that's the, that's the internal storytelling. And the external storytelling is the marketing in a sense of why are we doing this stream uh, and why should a viewer be excited about it? And right. is there a story behind this besides, well, we can't be on the road, so here's a stream for you instead. <laughs> exactly. You miss Melvin Seals, here's a chance to see him. <laughs> Right. And obviously, you know, that's already going to sell some tickets yeah. for us. But to include, just like um, they do for television shows, you know, that marketing and, and those commercials or even those cliffhangers that are happening at the ends of episodes and everything, those are all ways of storytelling in a way that will actually bring somebody back over and over again. So how does a band do that? Um, and there's obviously innumerable ways of doing that but how do we tell a good story how do we make people get on at this time um and so people are tackling that right now and really there's for being an observer of that you know in my capacity as tour manager listening to the experts talk about that um is great it's a huge learning experience for me and it's something that i want to uh, I want to serve as a channel, as an open channel for that kind of information to be spread around. I want the right people to hear that kind of stuff so that we can get great product into into the marketplace. And I would I'd love to be a part of that in any way that I can. If that means that I'm hosting a radio show, talking about it, or if that means I'm, I'm somebody feels that my perspective is valuable enough for their own product or it's just a friend that is trying to bounce ideas off of me, I want to live up to my responsibility in the music industry to serve as that as that channel for people to network off of and to learn from. Yeah, that, you know, you've always been, and I admire this about you, you've always been somebody who has, it seems like a million projects happening at once, a million plates spinning, you know, balls in the air, whatever metaphor you want to use. And uh, I wonder, like, can you tell me a little bit about that? Because that's so opposite from me. I am such a, like, one thing at a time person. So, I mean, is that kind of always how you've been? Or is that something you developed as you kind of, like, headed into this creative career? Right. Um, that's a good question. I I don't know. I, I think it's come, come naturally to me. Uh, I'm not a one person at a thing kind of person. I am... Uh, you know, I was listening to your episode with uh, Allison Olander. Mm -hmm, you had a you had a great show with her, and um, I was laughing out loud listening to it because you had both said that you know one week it, it's cooking, <laughs> and one and one week it's recording an album, and, and the next week you know you might be taking on something else. And I think that's that's sort of where I'm at. I I I like to stick to things and execute, but I make smaller goals for myself. That's kind of the way that I get through. Um, many different projects at once. I don't, I think I'm a dreamer <laughs> in some ways, but my eye isn't always like pie in the sky dreaming away. I'm just trying to execute simple goals and different things. And that keeps me interested. And then I've always just done different things because, and maybe you know this too, when you're in the music industry, I talk about this all the time, you have to wear different hats. There's only 
so many people that can get away with doing one thing. Sure. And I actually admire those people. It's, you know, whenever you're looking at it from the other side, I admire somebody that is that is so focused on one thing and trying to execute it to the best of their ability. And that's a that's a beautiful thing. And I watch that in some of my friends and, and artists that, that have that luxury in a sense to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't, I don't know if you see that too. I think a lot of us wear a lot of different hats. And then if you're going for it, then you eventually end up, you know, kind of juggling different projects at once. Yeah, maybe for me, it's a matter of like, you know, getting to know one aspect of a job really well at a time, because I really don't like to go into things not knowing what I'm doing. And I realize that, of course, that's being an adult is you go into things not knowing what you're doing and you figure it out. But like, you know, the uh, the part of the music world I was in for the last five years in radio, like it's absolutely one of those everybody wears multiple hats industries because it's such a scrappy industry at this point, you know. So like I was the music director, I was the afternoon host, I would help with live events, like everybody would do everything. Um, and there's I have no problem with that. And like all of those jobs, you know, kind of went hand in hand and like, would help each other out. You know, my job as music director made me better on air because I had, you know, this behind the scenes look at our music selection process and things like that. But um, yeah, I don't know. I I feel very um, intimidated by time management too. Is that ever an issue for you? Like, I just feel like there's not enough hours in the day, you know? (laughs) Yeah. um, Yeah. Time management for sure. And um... I don't know. For me, the busier I get, and I've heard other people say this too, the busier I get, the more time that I find to get things done. And so if I am really focused on like four different projects that are kind of driving me crazy, I'll always find like the five minutes in here to get this done or, you know, a half hour to whatever to set aside for another thing. It's when I'm not doing that, which I've had those moments during COVID for sure. It's when I'm not focused on those projects is when I feel like I have no time for anything. Mm. I, I'm, I've heard it from other people. I don't know if you ever feel that way, but um, that is definitely how I feel. The busier I get, the more time I have to, to put energy into things. I do think I know what you mean. Yeah, I've definitely had that experience during COVID where, you know, like I I lost my job and then there was all of this free time. And then as soon as there's all this free time, it's, oh, well, there's things I should be doing. I should fix this, that and that around the house. I should, you know, do this, that and that with the dogs. I should shop and clean and errands and this and that. Whereas like, yeah, if I have jobs that I'm doing, if I have things that I'm responsible for or projects that I want to complete, even just for my own edification, I will make time for those things. I don't know. I, I'm also not really a work person. I'm, you know, I will I will work as hard as I need to. I'm happy to, you know, work hard, but uh, I, I prefer to live for the things that I enjoy outside of work. So I like, I don't know, is, is that you or are you more of like you're happiest when you're, you know, working on a project? Well, I think I've been so, first of all, I have to say that's great that you say that, that you live for, for things outside of work because that's really valuable because so many people don't and they don't love their jobs. Yeah. And that can be really draining. Um, I think that I really love music and I've known that for a while. Um, and just kind of putting my faith in music has, and, and, and I mean faith in, in, in such a loose way, obviously, okay. but um, kind of uh, putting my, maybe I should say attention, but putting my attention towards music has brought me on such a crazy trip in so many different directions. So I think that I am happiest when I am diving deep, when I'm really... <laughs> when I'm really like in the shit. Like for example, I've been writing an album all through um, all through COVID. Yeah. And it took me a while to warm up to the fact or to, to warm up to the the act, I should say, of of writing. And a, a lot of songwriters say this too, like they'll do anything besides songwrite. They'll any excuse to not actually write is like a songwriter's greatest hobby. Mm-hmm. But, um, and, and it did take me a while. 
I was like, oh, the, the world is changing. I don't, I'm not on tour. There's no shows. And that's an easy way to get yourself into some serious depression. But what I noticed was when I just took that little time out to start, it, it was actually the turning point in like quarantine for me. It was probably in like the beginning of April when I forced myself to take on another project, which was this album. I already had things going on. I'm still working with Melvin. You know, obviously our touring schedule is all but nil, but I handle a lot of his affairs. And um, now I'm teaching as well. So I already have some other things going on while I'm home. But to take on what I think is a pretty big project of, of recording and releasing your own music, um, that was actually the turning point. That actually made me feel really good. And now... I'm in the midst of all this. There's still, you know, money being spent to record this album. It's not out yet. Uh, there's all sorts of headaches that are going along with it. Um, and I find myself really happy and grateful dealing with those headaches. Yeah. Um, so you are, you know, you're somebody who does what you love for a living. And like truly, you know, and I think a lot of people start down that road or, or try to do that and find that, you know, when you make your hobby a job, then you, you know, don't like it anymore. But for you, you know, music is just your entire life. And, uh, you know, it's, it's your, your first true love and, you know, continues to, <laughs> it's continues my first to... true love. And I fight with it just like I, like anybody <laughs> would fight with their first true love. And that's even more of a reason for me to be so in love with music. Uh, I'm, I've, as I've taken on all these projects and, and worn all these different hats and, managing a club and tour managing and and all the different things that I've done in those years have just made me fall in more and more in love with it and those headaches while they're super frustrating to get through many days you know that could you know that could ru ruin a day potentially it's actually really the stuff that I love and I think that that has given me the longevity in the music industry because you 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 have to love the bad days too yeah yeah, absolutely. So tell me about recording an album right now. How have you been going about it? Did you go to a studio or do you have a home setup? I have. I have a little home setup, but uh, it's uh, nothing special. And so I'll, I'll do demos here and I write. Um, it's been a really nice time not being on the road and taking the time to write like that. I haven't, haven't done that in a while. I released a single last year and really the album before that was the album that i released with the grape and the grain the end of 2016 probably early 2017 it's been a, it's been several years since i since i did an album so um i started writing in my in my room in my apartment and since then yeah i've i don't have a band <laughs> and uh <laughs> i i I write music for a, a rock outfit, you know, or even bigger than that sometimes. You know, I'm not really writing singer-songwriter stuff, although sometimes I do. But I don't have a band. So what this pandemic afforded me, actually, um, was the, uh, the, the luxury of having all of the other musicians not on the road and at home as well. Mm -hmm. Meaning... Mm -hmm. Meaning I could call just about anybody I wanted to work with and they could either, I could either record, you know, at their place, which I've done. I've been to a couple beautiful Hudson Valley studios. I'm so lucky to uh, have been at these places. But also I've been able to just call people that are kind of waiting at their homes for for a gig, for, for a recording job. Something so do, yeah. this album has been made with, I have different bands. I have like three different drummers on it. And they're like my favorite. I have Justin Gwip from Hot Tuna is, is uh, drumming on it. I have my, my musical cohort, Dana Fasano drumming on it. I have members of the Cat Wright band, you know, Cat Wright and the Indomitable Soul Band. You've yeah, played them sure. on your show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Cat Wright from Vermont, uh, and well, her bass player, and Scott Guberman, who plays with Phil Lesh from The Grateful Dead. Anyway, all these people, I was actually able to get them on my record. And I think something like that would not have been able to happen had this uh, circumstance not been brought up. But your question was, uh, have I gone places? And yes, I have. I've been to, like I said, the, the, some beautiful studios. I've been to 
the building, I have to give these places shout outs real quick because yeah, they're so, such amazing places. The building in, um, in Marlboro, which is Lee Falco from the restless age. Sure. Uh, he, he produced a couple of these tracks for me and, uh, he, he's actually playing drums on some of my tracks too. Awesome. So I went there, I went to Lone Pine Road Studios in Kingston oh. with Eli Winograd, which is now since closed. Yeah, because I saw of he was pandemic. selling that space. Yeah. That's great that you recorded there though. I love him. Love him too. And I have great songs. And in fact, the first single that I'm going to release is called Rock Bottom and it was, uh, recorded right at his place. And then I was also at Justin Gwip's place, the, this drummer from Hot Tunis, and, me, and he was also, he's got a couple Grammys from Levon. He was involved with the Helms for many years. Um, and I was at his place in Milan, New York, gorgeous studio. Mm. So yeah, kind of kind of all over the place. And I, I never thought that I would have recorded an album like this, but it's been really, really fun. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And I mean, so with so many different you know, kind of band lineups on the record, it sounds like it's going to be an interesting sounding record. You know, did you kind of write the songs as, you know, I, I'm a big dork for um, concept albums, so I'm always curious if there's like a thread running through the record or if it's more of a collection of songs. Like, what was your concept for this? Yeah, this one is going to be, uh, uh, it's, this one is going to be more varied for sure because it was recorded in different studios. There's different, uh, people on it, but it's also just how I write songs. And I think in my journey as a songwriter, and this has been over many years, I've been writing songs for years and years and playing them live and I recorded some, but it's only been very recently in the last two or three years that I really thought seriously about recording my own music under my own name, yeah. which is very different than recording for a band or some sort of pseudonym, like even for the grape and the grain. I wrote with them and for them, but I was writing in that style. So when you put a name on it, and that's why I actually use Daniel Mark, it actually helps me in some sort of strange way to kind of get out of myself mm. and, and maybe write things that I wouldn't normally have written, but it's still very much my name and I feel like it's still very much my baby. And um, so yeah, these songs are all different, and, and that is my songwriting style. And I think I'm still finding my way as far as that goes. But what I, what I really like about it, you know, for me, it's a strength. For me, I'm able to hear and really get nerdy about different orchestrations and instrumentation for different songs. So for me, it's less about the concept of the whole album, but rather taking different songs and creating the proper ambiance and sound for that. And I'm certainly still learning and there's there's stuff to be tweaked, but I've really enjoyed diving into these songs and kind of saying, you know, who would sound good on this? What, what instrument would sound good on this? Yeah, it sounds like a blast. Sounds like a really fun process, putting this all together and just having full creative control over it. Yeah, it's the first time that it's just been me uh, as basically the executive producer. And it's really fun to record with friends, but uh, it's a democratic process when you do it with a band. And anybody that's been in a band can tell you about the frustrations of recording when everybody has an equal say. <laughs> All right, we got a new sponsor on the show this week. Susan Barnett is a licensed associate broker with Keller Williams Upstate Country Properties at 31 Main Street, Oneonta, New York. She's a member of the Otsego, Delaware Board of Realtors, as well as the New York State Multiple Listing Service. And she is the person you want on your team when it's time to buy a house in upstate New York. Now, uh, here's a pro tip. If you are looking to buy property in upstate New York, go a little further upstate because as you know, the Hudson Valley is uh, just a little bit too hot right now. The market is ridiculous. You are going to pay out the nose for a house that's not even that great with no property. Speaking from experience here, just go a little bit further upstate. You get your quiet nights, your dark skies, your beautiful open country, your big, gorgeous, classic vintage farmhouse dreams all coming true for prices that you cannot even imagine. It is uh, so much more for your money if you go just a little bit further west. And Susan Barnett 
is going to hook it up for you. She's got more than 10 years in the business, extensive experience with downstate buyers. She specializes in historic and character homes and property. Uh, I can personally vouch she's been snooping around in old houses since I was a kid, and uh, she will... She will help you find the place that is perfect for you. And she's not going to want you to settle for some place that isn't right. And if you're selling, she'll give you tips to maximize your profit and give you a realistic idea of the market. Buying or selling is a big decision. You need an advocate. You need great service. You need Susan Barnett, licensed associate broker, UpstateCountryRealty.com. Um, well, so Dan, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what you've been doing outside of music during quarantine, which of course, you know, you've been working on your podcast, but you've also, you and I have done one thing in common, which is started a vegetable uh -oh. garden, which that was my first shot at a veggie garden. What about you? Is this your first time? No, it's not my first time, <laughs> um, but I've been getting, I've been getting much better at it. Um, I started, I really had apartments in Kingston, all the apartments I had, you couldn't really grow anything besides a container tomato. Yeah. Um, and this is the first year that I have a backyard and kind of went crazy with it. And I've just been, it's kind of exploded. I mean, it's really kind of like a, it's a, like a mini farm. It's amazing, <laughs> It's only right? two raised beds and it takes up, you know, the, the back half of my little backyard. But um, I'm growing, I don't know what you're growing, but I'm growing crazy amount of tomatoes this year. Yeah. I have like hundreds, I'm serious about hundreds of tomatoes coming in. Yeah, it's terrifying. Tomatoes are, my, my tomato plant is genuinely, I'm a little afraid of it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so what I did, I've got this house that we moved into uh, in late 2018 and the backyard is small, but you know, we fenced the whole thing in because we've got the dogs and uh, I noticed over like the beginning of the warm season this year i was thinking about putting in a garden and then i had the time so i was like okay i'm definitely going to do this and i noticed there was one patch of the yard like this back left corner where these weeds i think they were like some kind of dock plant were growing massive like just on their own you know nothing i planted but they were just thriving in this one back corner so i was like okay that's where the good soil is so i tried to do it right you know i like i pulled out all the weeds i tilled i put down compost and mulch and I did, um, initially I just did cucumbers, uh, three varieties of spicy pepper. I did, uh, the tomatoes actually came later. I planted a peach tree and I did squash. And the success of everything except the cucumbers has been astounding. I'm not sure what happened with the cucumbers. They, they grew like crazy. They climbed, you know, the vines looked amazing, but I only ever got one cucumber and then they all died. But uh, everything else... Did they all wilt quickly? Did yeah. the leaves wilt quickly? Yeah, they were very healthy one day and then they all started to die the next. Did you have that experience? Well, I, I know very well about this experience. Really? I know very well. And, Do you know why? But I think that you have, which many people around here have, is the elusive cucumber beetle. I don't know if you huh. if you if you researched any of it and it may or may not, but what happens with cucumbers and uh, and also squash and zucchini with something uh, with a different kind of bug. But what will happen with with cucumbers is you'll have a, like a perfectly beautiful plant ready to pop and within 48 hours all the leaves are wilting and if you don't do anything about it it's already it's actually already too late like once you see those leaves starting to wilt they're done that thing that plant is as good as gone that and so yeah. this year i have gone crazy uh ri organically ridding my plant of cucumber beetles and this there's literally they crawl all over them but they're only they're too quick to catch i'm so nerdy about gardening so i will talk about this for a <laughs> yeah, while let's but go. Rock and uh, roll. but it, but in short they're too quick to catch uh in the in the morning and or in during the day so you have to like in the morning find these little yellow and black beetles and just literally pick them up and squish them and it's huh. like Unless you want to spray heavy chemicals, it's kind of the only way to do it. Is it the kind of thing where you have to like slice open the vine really carefully and find them in there or are they just on the surface? Because I never saw them and I did have like some bugs, I had like ants on my squash at one point and I sprinkled diatomaceous earth and that took care of it. So yep, are, they, yep. are they are they hiding oh, I'm inside? Loving the vine? that you're getting so nerdy about this. We've already <laughs> said diatomaceous earth, which is a beautiful thing. Oh, but yeah. uh, so on the squash and zucchini, sometimes you have to 
slice them open. That's for something else. The the, the name evades me right now. It's like a um, worm, maybe. I think that's like a type of worm. Yeah, and or the vine borer. The yeah. vine borer. They get in there, they lay their eggs, and you got to slice that open for the squash zucchini. With the cucumbers, though, no, they were just kind of hanging out. Or a lot of the times, they'd hang out in those little yellow flowers. Yeah. They'd be the little yellow flowers that the cucumbers put out. They'll be inside of those, just kind of like sleeping or like mating, because that's really all they love to do all day is mate and make more of them. So. This took a while. I mean, this was like two weeks of me being out there every day uh, for a while, just kind of, you know, maybe like a half hour, just kind of finding these things. And this was at night. So you take a flashlight out there and you go out or if you got a headlamp, that's even better. And you just go out and you basically pick these things off and put them in a little, I got a little jug with uh, soap with soap and water and then that kind of takes care of them so no i didn't slit anything open but i worked really hard and they still it was it was hard to save and i think my cucumbers are done for the season yeah well good for you for good for you for doing the research making the effort i just kind of was like i don't know i guess they didn't get pollinated because i didn't see anything but i should have looked closer but i did uh i nailed it on the other stuff like i can't even and you know i'm an amateur like i asked some of my friends who you know farm a little bit more than i do for a little bit of advice here and there but mostly i was flying blind and so the tomato came in i went to visit a friend of mine down in uh, ackard and they're great gardeners and you know grow stuff every year and she had a bunch of like tomato starters and she sent me home with one she's like oh you know just whatever, like, it's not that great of a tomato, it's not an heirloom or anything, but, you know, it'll, it'll be a tomato for you. I'm like, all right, great. So I planted it, it was just a little, you know, a little starter, a little baby plant, and that thing is, it's like, you ever see uh, Akira, like, just, like, the tendrils everywhere, just, like, taking over and absorbing everything, like, it's uh-huh. insane, and I mean, obviously, I'm getting a million tomatoes out of it, which is great, but I can't believe how happy it is, and the squash was super happy, it had a boom, the peppers, I'm drowning in peppers, and they are so spicy, I can't... Well, what kind of peppers are you growing? I did jalapenos, poblanos, and banana peppers, and they are all... I mean, the poblanos aren't as spicy, but the jalapenos and banana peppers are, like... I, they're, like, a little bit too much for me. Like, luckily, my boyfriend likes spicy things, because I'm, like... <laughs> I, 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 I can't even handle them. Um, yeah, so those did really, really well. And uh, the peach tree, which is something I've always wanted. I always wanted a fruit tree in my yard. I just yeah, tell me more about the peach tree. I didn't even think that we'd be able to grow peach tree here. The peach tree is doing really well. So again, I went to a, a local, I went to actually the apple bin on 9W, which has a lot of fruit trees in season, and uh, they had saplings, and I bought a little peach tree sapling and took it home, and again, like, tried to follow the instructions on the tag, but like, didn't really know what I was doing. And it's doing great. It's thriving. And I had some issues. You know, my biggest hurdle for this garden was figuring out the fencing because I do have dogs that also use that backyard. And uh, the younger one, the puppy, really wanted to eat the peach tree. She just really wanted to chew the branches off of it. And she got a few of them. And I was heartbroken. I felt like, you know, I'd failed as a parent. You know, I was like, I adopted this baby tree and then allowed harm to come to it. I felt so guilty. Um, but I looked into it and everybody was like, you know what, just like trim the branches that she chewed so that they're not ragged edges. That'll give it a better chance and just keep watering it and giving it love. And it is so healthy. And, uh, I've, I've since fixed the fence, you know, I have a a good fencing system up now, but, uh, you know, it's ironic because we may not end up staying in this house for, you know, five more years in time to see the thing actually fruit, like the next owners will enjoy it. But, uh, yeah, I... I have successfully planted a peach tree. It can be done. That's a beautiful thing. I want to see pictures of that peach tree as soon as possible. I'll send you with uh, like the the grandma frame with like the hearts around it. I, I would expect nothing less. <laughs> so yeah, you're drowning in tomatoes. Do you do? I, like a lot of my friends are also planting this year or have planted this year, and it's wonderful to be able to do like veggie exchanges. Have you been uh, doing any of that? Um. No, I haven't been, we haven't been doing any veggie exchange. I've definitely just been giving a lot of tomatoes out and my parents are probably inundated with tomatoes right now. My dad was actually just over a couple hours ago and we gave him a bunch. And so they've been nice as, as kind of, they're the perfect Hudson Valley summer gift. You know, you can come over to somebody's place and you don't need to buy a bottle of wine. You just bring them out like a bunch of tomatoes in a bag and they're, they're just as happy for that. Just stuff from your garden. It feels so good to just have stuff from your garden that you can share with people. 
Oh, it's amazing. And just, just walking through there. I mean, the big thing for me is like, uh, we're, we're, I'm still in Kingston and uh, like right off of a main street, uh, kind of off Broadway, but still on a, a busy enough street. And so, um, you know, I'm still, I'm still in the, the city as it were, the small city and the garden has provided such a nice oasis to actually be outside and, and almost feel like I'm in the woods for a while yeah. and uh, just the lushness of it now. And I think because I gave it so much love over the last few months with a garden, you really feel that thing giving back to you. And so I'm, I'm sad that summer is ending because I've had such a great time hanging out there and I've written some songs in the backyard even this summer. So it's been a beautiful thing. I'm really happy to have done it and to have learned a lot this year because of the time that I've had to put into it. Yeah, me too. And like the satisfaction of even just like I would sit on the back stoop some days and just like sip my coffee and just stare at the garden. Just like I did that. (laughs) That's what I did. And like going out in the middle of the heat wave every day and making sure everybody had enough water. And like it was such a labor of love. So yeah, to really. It's also the first place in many years that I mow the grass now. Yeah. Yeah. So I love talk about like I will grab a coffee depending on the time of day, a coffee or a beer, and just sit on the the, the back porch and look at my freshly mowed grass, and I I feel like oh this is what it's like to be an adult. Like I'm so proud and happy to look at this freshly mowed grass. Like I'm, I'm a real I'm a real man now. Yeah. I mean I'm a real man too. I love that <laughs> shit. I get out there. I got out there yesterday with the string trimmer. And again, like we have a very small manageable yard. Like if I had like acres and acres to deal with, I'm sure I wouldn't be this on top of it. But it's just right. like such a good feeling to like, all right, well, grass is getting a little long. I'm gonna go take care of it and just get out there with the string trimmer. And I have a little um like a, a manual mower, you know, it doesn't have an engine, it's just like, you know, the blades and you just push yeah, it. I have the same. I have the manual, it's it's a Fiskers made by the scissors company. Oh, I don't know if mine is. Mine might be like a, a much shittier brand, but I love it because it's silent and it smells great. You just smell fresh cut grass. There's no gasoline yep. smell or anything. And exactly. You need to refill it with the gas or anything. It's so, it's so nice. And I, I was never like that. Like my parents were not the go mow the grass kind of parents when I was a kid. My dad is a rabbi and my mother is a rabbi's wife and a teacher. <laughs> and so... It was just not, it was a very, it was not that growing up. It was, it really wasn't. And I don't think I even mowed grass until maybe, maybe this year. Maybe this is the first time that I really got sweat on my brow from mowing grass. So really? it's, that was, it feels, it, was, it feels like a transformation of sorts. That was a chore that I had for a while. I mean, you know, I had an older brother too, so we would split it. And it was never like, you know, we were never really assigned chores. It was just like, hey, somebody go mow the lawn. And we, for a while, living in Connecticut growing up, we had uh, a very big hilly backyard. Like it was on this steep slope and it was pretty big. So we got a riding mm-hmm. mower. So like we wanted to do it because everybody wanted to go ride on the riding mower. So we would like oh, fight over who got to go mow the lawn. So yeah, like there's something very satisfying about uh, about outdoor manual work, especially when it's your place that you're making look good. And that just makes you want to like invite people over to hang out in the backyard and like, yeah, look what I did. Totally. I wish more people have seen what I'm doing. I've been, you know, I've been pretty distant from people and I've had some, so a couple of friends over, um, but it's, it's strange not, not having a bunch of people over yet. Maybe next year I'll get the whole outside entertainment kit and I'll have a big party. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a fire pit or anything back there? Yeah, I got a little I don't know what you call it, but it's uh it's it's you know, it's a it's like a metal fire pit that yeah. has it's like a little chimney basically and you it's got a little door and you throw the the wood in there and I've been making fires in there. I just had one last night. My my clothes all smell like smoke probably oh. from the windows being open and the fire going, but That's the best. it's so nice. I was thinking that being next to a fire is like just as relaxing as being near an ocean all day. I feel like when I come back in the house after making a fire and sitting in front of it for a few hours, I have that same sense of like being like tired and relaxed. Yeah, there's a very like, I think it does something to like the primal, you know, Neanderthal part of our brains just staring at a fire because, you know, you can get together with friends and sit around and talk in the living room, but you'll sit way longer around a fire, I've found, you know, like, there's just something about like 
sitting around a fire, watching the fire, listening to music around the, playing music around the fire, just something about the fire keeps people yeah. entertained for such a long time. And I love like my clothes smelling like smoke. I love everything about it. Me too, totally. And you're so right. It, it hits something like we're not, we're not supposed to be in living rooms, like getting served tea. Like we're supposed to be outside around a fire telling stories. And I think that's so right. It really hits on something, uh, you know, primeval or something that's, that you don't get, you can't get in many ways, uh, nowadays especially around these parts so yeah. it's a it's a beautiful thing i still feel good today from having this nice fire last night you're making me think i should just have one tonight <laughs> just sit out back by myself with the dogs and watch the fire i might do it get out there do it <laughs> so are you gonna do any uh, any pickling or canning have you gotten that far into the home garden oh, process exactly. oh yeah just because i've been making tomato sauce and yeah. I, we're so i can't tell you i can't quite express on this podcast, actually, how many tomatoes are coming in every day? <laughs> I believe but, you. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I've been making sauces, and somebody asked me if I could can them, and so I'm going to look into it. But you know, I'm always like Google anytime I'm thinking about something new. Obviously, like everybody else, I just Google it and do a little research. But there's some there's some tricks of the trade to really can something acidic yeah. the right way. Canning but I really want to get into canning the sauce before the season is over. So yeah. I haven't done anything yet, but I'm hoping to report to you in the future that I will have a can of tomato sauce. If anyone can do it, you can do it. I know that canning is a little bit uh, scientific. Like there's certain, you know, degrees that you need to heat the water and cool the water huh. and times you need to blah, blah, blah to ensure that, you know, you get a seal and everything. Yeah. Um, so I haven't embarked on any canning yet myself either, but I do pickle. I enjoy pickling. Pickling is extremely easy and rewarding. What are you pickling? Are you pickling cucumbers? Are you pickling other stuff? Well, my cucumbers didn't pan out this year, but I pickled some of the spicy peppers, and that was really fun. Um, I did uh, just like I threw them all in together. I like chopped up the banana peppers, so I've got like the classic little banana pepper ringlets, and then I've got mm -hmm. the jalapenos and poblanos in there too because I had so many, and I can't even stress to you like I only had one of each plant, but they just all were so so productive, which has been amazing. So um, yeah, I just threw them all in, and you do you know you like look up the recipe. I looked up you know however much vinegar to put and it's vinegar water salt and then whatever kind of flavors and i did it like an herb pot too so i have my own fresh parsley and dill um the cilantro mm. ended but uh, i did have cilantro for a while and yeah you just totally control what you want it to taste like and again this is basically going to be you know pickled peppers that i give out to other people because they're too spicy for me <laughs> but that's uh amazing. that's all i gotta i gotta look into that more seriously i would love to have something like that and i have a lot of hot peppers coming in right now too yeah uh, it's but great. i want to so taste some banana peppers i'm not doing banana peppers but i have poblanos serranos jalapenos habaneros and thai hots and i would love to pickle some of those. Yeah, pickle those bitches. It's so okay. easy. And they'll last forever. That's the greatest thing because it's like, you know, just capturing the magic of your summer garden all year long. You know, not to sound too fucking Martha Stewart, but it's true. <laughs> we're good. We're good Hudson Valley citizens. We're becoming somehow. It's funny. Yeah, I know. Early in, uh, early in the pandemic and the quarantine and everything, there was like a lot of you know, jokes going around on the internet about how, you know, for years, like our generation, millennials, we've been made fun of for like not knowing how to do anything. Like millennials can't cook for themselves. They can't this and that. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're all baking bread and like growing gardens and pickling while baby boomers are like, I want to go to Applebee's. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's true. I feel, and I feel really good about it. I've been, you know, I, I've been healthier, I think, this year because I've not been eating out so much. And what people don't realize is, maybe people do or they don't choose to realize it, is when you go out, you are eating so much salt and butter salt and that butter, you, can't even, yeah. you can't even possibly <laughs> believe actually how much salt and butter you're eating every time you go out. And I'm, I love going out. I love nothing. I'm a bon vivant. I love, I'll go out any night and have some wine and go chill. But actually, this is the first year that, like, I haven't been out. I haven't been out once in six months. Wow. So yeah, it's so it's, true. And, you know, I've brought in, maybe I've had delivery a couple times, but there's really every night I'm eating stuff that I prepare myself. And when you do that, you just, you just feel better. Absolutely. No, it's so true. I mean, that's why takeout food and restaurant food tastes so good. It's because all the butter and salt and like, it's not that that's 
a bad thing or a secret that they're trying to hide from us, but it's something to be aware of. Like, that's why, yeah. you know, if you eat out every day, not only you'll, you know, lose a bunch of money, but you'll probably gain a little bit of weight because it's just... And even healthy stuff, like people don't really like sushi and, and stuff like that, or you have like a salad with your, go out to a sushi restaurant. The amount of salt that you're having is is really not good yeah. for just about anybody. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been doing more home cooking myself. Um, you know, my, my partner is usually the cook in the relationship, and he's been, you know, working away from home most of the week. So I've been, you know, fending for myself. And I decided early on, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to fall into the habit of just, like, buying snacks. And, like, I'm very much somebody who could subsist on snacks, just graze throughout the day. And I was like, I'm not going to do that to myself. I'm going to eat a balanced diet. I'm going to cook vegetables, cook, you know, lean meats, lean proteins. And, um, yeah, it's been great. It's been very easy. Um, I've been using – we have, like, a Ninja Foodie. Do you have any, uh, any like, fun kitchen tricks that you do right now? uh kitchen tricks well what's ninja foodie what, what is that it's a glorified toaster oven is what it is it's it's okay. uh, on paper it's an air fryer but i mean it's there's nothing fried about anything it's just a toaster oven but it's got like a, it's super powerful it's got a bunch of settings and i was always somebody who was kind of intimidated by cooking meat like i was vegetarian for a long time in my early 20s and just kind of like never really learned about cooking meat so much and this thing makes it super easy it just like blast it out it's good it stays juicy like so mm. i highly recommend the ninja okay okay no i don't have any uh i don't have any tricks or anything like that everything's been pretty been pretty simple what i'm trying to think trying to think of anything weird that I've but no the the only thing and it's probably not so healthy that I discovered this year is the beauty of putting cornstarch in a sauce oh yeah <laughs> and like any like Asian sauces I've been making like a lot of string beans I've, I've sauteed green beans my whole life or whatever but this year I'm actually like trying to get sauces that taste a little bit more like they're or, or not taste but actually like it's the consistency, and it is. It's the sugar. It's brown sugar. Mm -hmm. And let me tell everybody right now, in case anybody's wondering, if you're trying to make a really great Asian sauce, you need all the all the Asian stuff that you normally put in the sauce. But what you're not putting enough of in is brown sugar and cornstarch. You can't overdo either of them, but if you get it right, it is so, so good. Yeah, that's where the texture comes from. You're totally right. I struggled with sauces for a long time too, where everything would just come out kind of like watery or oily. And it is, it's, you gotta, you can't be afraid of the cornstarch and the brown sugar. I know, I know. It's, well, that's the reason why it tastes so good is that, is that sugar. And so that was one little unhealthy secret that I uncovered. I and mean, that's really the reason why I've discovered so much because not eating out has made me realize, you know, like how much butter and salt are in everything. And because I'm putting in my own for, for all this stuff, but it's been good. I, I hope that this, I hope that that's one thing that stays with me is that I'm, I'm cool. I'm okay to stay in a little longer, that I have the patience and not have such deep FOMO all the time, like I'm missing something that might possibly be happening uptown or downtown, and to just kind of be okay with staying home. And it was this, that was something that I really had to learn this year. Yeah, well, I mean, we all did, and early on it was really hard for, you know, especially a lot of my more extroverted friends, it was like really hard to have to limit your social interaction and, it still is tough. I mean, you know, even the shows that are starting to come back are not going to be exactly the same for a while. And you kind of have to make the choice of like, is it even worth going to this event? Or should I just, you know, continue to distance and continue to be, you know, to stay safe? Like, I have to be careful because, you know, DJ is uh, essentially breadwinning right now, so I can't get him sick. So, you know, it's like you mm -hmm. got to kind of be OK with uh, with keeping a distance. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's, I think it's okay. You know, I, obviously I'm waiting for, uh, people to be more comfortable with getting back out and I'm looking forward to the day that we do see concerts happening again in some sort of manner like they were. But again, having that patience to just try and be more in the moment, it's been an exercise all year, to be honest, because there are days where it can get the better of you. But on the days that I realize that I should be very grateful for all the things that I have in my life and uh, grateful for the pace that I'm taking my life at this year. I mean, the last three years, if I wasn't driving to Vermont twice a week, 
which is a four hour back and forth drive that I was doing about twice a week for two or three years to gig. If I wasn't doing that, I was on a flight to go meet up with, with Melvin Seals or do a gig somewhere else. And it was, it was beautiful. I mean, I love that lifestyle and, uh, took a, took a second, but, uh, I'm grateful now to, to just slow down. And, uh, I still get those, those kind of urges, you know, every few, every so often I'll be like, I, I don't feel like I'm moving around as much as I was the last few years. And I just kind of have to center myself and take that cup of coffee and go out into the garden and, and chill out for a second and realize that, um, it's kind of a beautiful life and I'm, I'm okay with 2020 in that sense. Wow. That is, uh, that maybe one of the loveliest things somebody said on this podcast so far. <laughs> well, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, I feel like on that note, uh, I want to kind of wrap it up. So in our last few minutes here, will you tell us, uh, you know, where we can find your podcast and your music and, you know, give us the rundown on the upcoming album and everything? Yeah, uh, you can find me anywhere, anything, anything with... With just music, uh, if I'm writing it, is under Daniel Mark, and uh, so Instagram and Facebook and everything like that. And then in any sort of business sense, it's Daniel Mark Sternstein, um, and that's kind of also you can find me anywhere else doing that. Um, and the record is, man, I would love to say that I knew a release date as of this date, but I don't. But what I do know is going to happen is I'm going to be releasing ways that people can support the album. And that's included something that I'm really proud of, which is I've worked with four Hudson Valley artists, my some of my favorite artists in the whole world, and they have created unique pieces of art for different songs on the record. Oh, cool. So I basically have stickers, which I could make into any number of things, but I'm doing like a limited edition sticker pack. I know that sounds strange, but it's actually art from all Hudson Valley artists doing this stuff, all for different songs on the record. So I don't have all the songs on the record, but for four of them, I think I'm getting another one in soon. There should be four or five songs on the record that have their own unique piece of art. And I'm going to be releasing those as ways to support the record when it comes out. And I'm hoping, you know, this record is very 2020. I, I wrote it all in quarantine and there's a tinge of that in some of these songs i'm hoping people will take that away from it in a sense so um i'm hoping october and uh but but anybody before then can absolutely go check me out on instagram or facebook and follow along and i'll be dropping a video soon be dropping the record soon as well as singles that won't even be on the record i've really had a lot of great time to work this year um, so that's that. And, and what else was your question? Was, uh, it, was it how people could find me? That's, that's podcast. basically how you find me tell or me, just call me up. I'm usually around. Tell me again about the podcast. It's a uh, DMMRR, uh, Daniel Mark's musical roundup rodeo available on all platforms. Available on all platforms. I was, I'm, I'm super excited to finally have it up on everything now on Spotify and, and Apple and, uh, anywhere you can get a podcast. So everybody that has a streaming service or can get an album in any sort of way, they can listen to the podcast. Awesome. Well, Daniel, this was so much fun. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, MK. I always love talking to you. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to More Music Please Quarantine Beat. Follow the show on Instagram at moremusic.podcast and check out the website moremusicpodcast.com for new episodes. Questions or comments, email moremusic.podcast at gmail.com. Thanks to DJ Scully, Michael Cadnar, and James Stewart for the catchy theme song you're hearing now. I'm MK Burnell. Talk to you next time.